are stories of reincarnation. They tell of young children who often, as soon as they can speak, talk about their real parents and their other homes. They seem to recall previous lives, often in such detail that they not only provide good copy for local journalists, but they persuade researchers all over the world that there's a phenomenon here worth investigating. Here's a story of a little boy, Ajit, who remembers drowning five years ago. And here is a story about a little five-year-old girl who thinks she's a man who was killed in a road accident. But the story which most fascinates me is one that comes from the place I love most in Sri Lanka, the beautiful little bay of Unawatuna on the shores of the Indian Ocean. The story is a tragic reminder of Sri Lanka's brief but bloody insurrection of 1971. A captured rebel, a young man named Robert, leapt to his death into the sea. His close companion, Johnny, had already been killed. These twin girls were not born until seven years later, yet almost as soon as they could speak, they claimed to be reincarnations of Johnny and Robert. Shiromi recounts gruesome details of Johnny's death. Shivanti says she remembers leaping into the sea with her wrists wired together. Such stories are intriguing, but for them to be accepted as evidence of reincarnation, every detail must be checked by a trusted investigator. Journalist Delreen Vigeratni covers many reincarnation stories. The latest comes from a jungle village, Pethiagada. In this case, four-year-old Inoka is the child who claims to have lived before. The story goes that when she first began to talk, Inoka told her mother, Rita Sriyani, that she had another family. They lived in a town called Minuwangada. She claimed to remember having two sisters and a brother. They lived in much less primitive surroundings. Their house had running water and electricity. Inoka's mother says she never believed in reincarnation and she certainly wasn't going to trek six miles through the jungle to Minawangada to check Inoka's claims. At first, we started ignoring her conversation because we didn't want our only daughter to talk about another family, another father and another mother. But Inoka's grandmother, Kiriyama, did listen to the tales of the little girl and in the end was persuaded to take her to Minawangada. At the Buddhist temple there, the priests were intrigued, but not surprised, for Buddhists believe in reincarnation. They soon discovered that eight years before, an 11-year-old girl called Milani had died in a motorbike accident. She'd had one brother and two sisters, and they'd lived in this modern house. It all fitted in Oka's description. When she was taken there, her first reactions amazed her mother, Rita Sriyani. She was no stranger in that house. And her first question was, where's my dog? She started calling the mother of her previous life, mommy. And Rita Sriyani was quite unhappy about it. And she was asking for all the toys of her previous birth. Today, Inoka frequently makes the journey to Minawangada. Milani's father welcomes Inoka as a member of the family. Bandu accepts her as his reborn sister. <laughs> The girls say Anoka knew their names the first time she came to play. And she went straight to this cupboard for the dead girl's suitcase of toys. She identified Milani's photograph as my picture, and she calls Mrs. Godagampala her real mother. And what difference did the Inoka's arrival make to your life? I'm very happy. 
because I had three or four children, I lost one and I got her back again. I see no other explanation to this story other than reincarnation. I mean, how can you expect a girl from, uh, from Petyagoda, that's six miles away from this spot, to talk of a family in Minuangoda that she has never seen or heard before? So you have to accept it as reincarnation and nothing else. So the strange claims Inoka made when she began to speak have brought great happiness to a family that no longer mourns. Stories of this kind are very rare in Britain. One of the most remarkable began in 1957 in Northumberland in the country town of Hexham. It was there one Sunday morning that tragedy struck John Pollock and his family. His two daughters and a friend were killed by a car on their way to church. Jacqueline was six and Joanna eleven when they died, but John Pollock did not despair while Hexham grieved. He believed that his wife would conceive twins, that the girls would be reborn. From the moment I knew she was pregnant, I believed that the girls would come back. And against all the doctor's predictions, Florence Pollock did produce twin girls. The first thing I noticed when I saw those twins was, we hadn't named them then, but the younger one of the two had a scar coming across her forehead down onto the bridge of her nose, which was the identical scar to the Jacqueline, the younger one of the girls that had been killed, had had when she fell off a little tricycle when she was about two years old. Also, I mean, I didn't see at the time, but later, my wife said to me, it's an incredible thing, but she's also got the birthmark on her left hip that Jacqueline had. Jacqueline had a birthmark on her left hip, which was like a brown thumbprint. To this day, Jennifer still has that brown birthmark. Mrs. Pollock was astonished when she gave the twins the dead girl's dolls. When I got these two <coughs> dolls out, one said, oh, that's Mary and that's Susan. And it was exactly the same names as my other daughters had named them. And that was the sort of really turning point in my way of thinking. The family had moved away after the tragedy, but on their first visit to Hexham, the twins seemed to remember the landmarks. Well, when we came at the top of Battle Hill, they came over the brow, approaching St Mary's Church, which they couldn't see. One turned to the other and said, well, the school's up around here, which we used to go to, and the playground's around the back. Now, they couldn't possibly have seen any sign of a school or a church even. I mean, they were so small, they couldn't even have seen over the wall. And uh, sure enough, I mean, the school is around the corner. And this was the most incredible thing. And we continued to walk on. I mean, we were absolutely amazed at this. And as we came past the church, on the opposite side of the road is Hexham Abbey and the Abbey grounds. And um, one turned and said, oh, the playground's over there. And she was right. The playground was over there, but they couldn't see it from where they were standing because the brow of the hill was in the way. So convinced were the Pollocks that their daughters had been reborn, that even the children's grave no longer held any sorrow for them. There's a grave there, but it means nothing. To me, to bring flowers or anything on the grave would be sort of... Well,